thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great uh, pleasure and a privilege to be here. Dani is one of my mathematical heroes. So to give a talk uh, at this event in his honor is um, a very uh, nice thing for me, but also a rather daunting task, given the extent of his repertoire. And uh, so he has interests in um, uh, many, many parts of mathematics. And if you look on MathSignet, you'll find uh, all sorts of nice papers and all sorts of topics. And uh, I'm not qualified to talk about uh, a lot of these topics, but uh, thankfully for me, about uh, more than half uh, concern a subject uh, which I work on, and the subject is called homogeneous dynamics. So the purpose of the talk today, uh, in consultation with the organizers, is to gently uh, survey some of uh, Dani's most prominent results in this area, and also provide an introduction to the subject uh, to you, the audience. It's a very exciting subject, and um, <clears throat> Dani's papers have been uh, very, very influential. So nowadays, when you go around uh, university administrative circles, you hear the word impact thrown at you all over the place. You know, What is the impact of your work? What uh, impact factor does this journal have? And so on and so forth. And uh, there are several of Danny's papers which have genuinely impactful in the sense that they've opened uh, entire new branches of mathematics. Uh, so I want to uh, uh, give you a glimpse of some of them and also introduce you to the mathematics behind them. Um, <clears throat> Dani's work uh, in this subject has uh, had two main um, components. The first is that uh, he was instrumental in setting up a lot of the main structural uh, work in this area. So somehow the, the, the most fundamental theorems uh, were um, conjectured by him and by Raghunathan. And uh, both uh, Raghunathan's conjecture was uh, inspired by early work of Dani during his thesis. There are two conjectures which Aravinda briefly alluded to. One is Dani's measure conjecture and the other is Raghunathan's topological conjecture. Uh, subsequently, uh, Dani and Margulis did uh, a lot of... Uh, influential work on these conjectures. They were settled in full generality by Marina Ratner. The second uh, impactful thing which Dani did, which in some sense, uh, at least uh, for me, is uh, even uh, um, uh, somehow has led to even more development since, is he uh, exploited and developed a lot of fruitful connections with number theory. So some of these connections are very surprising, uh, and all of them have led to a lot of uh, work being done. So uh, he has been influential in setting up a lot of uh, cottage industries of people like me who can then uh, try to figure out what he was trying to say. So uh, the talk is going to be as follows. In the beginning, I'm going to introduce you to what uh, this term means, what is homogeneous dynamics. And then we'll go through a historical ramble through the subject, but not exactly uh, in terms of uh, not, you know, we won't uh, follow a linear path because somehow uh, Dani was doing many things at the same time and we have to uh, do a slightly random walk around his papers. And uh, I hope at the end of this you'll have some uh, understanding of uh, what it is that uh, we who study the subject to do. Before I begin, I should mention that uh, if you're interested in uh, a more panoramic view of what Dani did, I would urge you to look at uh, this uh, uh, collection of papers, which uh, was the proceedings in honor of his 60th birthday, 65th birthday. Um, this has many nice papers by leading experts in the subject. In particular, it has two surveys, one by Dave Vitti Morris on some of the sub stuff that I'm going to talk about, his work on homogeneous dynamics, and the other by Francois Ledrapier and Reddy Shah, who is in the audience, on his work on probability measures and groups. So these are both excellent references to some of the <coughs> themes in which run through Dani's work. Okay, very good. So now uh, let's begin uh, 
uh, by trying to understand what a homogeneous space is. So homogeneous space, as I understand it, is going to be one of the following. It's going to be a Lie group, uh, and you take the quotient of the Lie group by some closed subgroup. So sometimes, most of the time, this closed subgroup is going to be a lattice. So what this means is that the closed subgroup is going to be a discrete subgroup of the Lie group, and the quotient is going to carry a g-invariant probability measure. Okay? So the first example that we all learn is the torus. So G is Rn and the gamma, which is the lattice, is Zn, and the quotient is compact. Um, for us, a more interesting class of examples arises when you look at non-abelian examples. So for, exam for instance, it's a famous uh, theorem of Borel and Harish Chandra that if you take a semi-simple Lie group, and the semi-simple Lie group has no non-trivial Q characters, then the set of integer points of the group forms a lattice. So this, for instance, gives us a rich class of examples, like uh, a G could be SL to R, and a gamma could be SL to Z. So I'm interested in the quotient space G mod gamma, and one of the reasons I'm interested in the quotient space G mod gamma is that this quotient space uh, frequently parametrizes objects of mathematical interest. For instance, this space here can be viewed as a space of lattices in R2 whose uh, co-volume is 1. So the co-volume is the area of the fundamental parallelogram of the lattice. So consider the integer lattice there 2 right? That has area one, the square is area one, and now you stretch the square with a two by two matrix of determinant one, and you get another lattice. The other lattice also has the square or, or a stretch square of area one. This quotient parametrizes is the moduli space of all such lattices. All right? So that's an interesting and important description of this homogeneous space. Um, Sometimes, uh, Dani has also studied uh, very profitably homogeneous spaces, which uh, are things like, um, uh, say, uh, G is uh, SL3R, and uh, H is SO21, okay? It's the stabilizer of an indefinite quadratic form of signature 2-1. All right, and the space uh, G mod H up to scaling uh, represents the space of all such quadratic forms. And dynamics on the space of all such quadratic forms can also be very profitably viewed to give us information on the quadratic forms. So this is a theme which we'll come back to. Okay? The main uh, example that I'd like you to have in mind for now is uh, something like this. So SL to R, SL to Z. SL to R, it turns out, also has lattices which are co-compact. One way of constructing them is to construct so-called orders in suitably defined central quaternion division algebra. Okay? All these groups, SL and R, have both co-compact and non-co-compact lattices. We are interested in the following dynamical system. We are going to take a subgroup of G and add on G mod gamma in the simplest way possible by translation. Okay. This dynamical system has a lot of information. So we have uh, gamma is a lattice, so gamma, G mod gamma comes uh, um, along with a probability measure. So then we can do ergodic theory by considering the actions of subgroups of G by translation on G mod gamma. This is a very rich class of systems and can exhibit uh, extremely chaotic behavior. Uh, what is somehow surprising is that sometimes uh, you have a very complicated group acting on a complicated quotient, but the action is actually very well behaved. And this was one of the main themes in the Dani and Raghunathan conjecture. We'll come to that briefly. Let's give two examples of such actions. The first uh, is the action of the upper triangular group 1x01 on SL2R factor SL2Z. Uh, 
This is a program on geometry, so I'm sure everybody knows what's going on here. You can uh, consider the action of SL2R on the upper half plane by Mobius transformations. The upper half plane is a quotient of SL2R. It's a quotient of SL2R by the orthogonal group. Okay? Uh, if you look, uh, so on the upper half plane, you have geodesics, which, as we know, uh, either uh, consist of moving along semicircles centered on the x-axis or vertical lines, and you have horocycles, which are circles centered on the x-axis. If you look at the quotient of the upper half plane by the modular group, SL to Z, you get what is called the modular surface, which is a favorite playing ground of number theorists. And uh, many of us, was there a question? Many of us would have seen the familiar picture of a fundamental domain for the modular surface. And this is a triangle in the upper half plane of finite area. Okay? The action of this group can be realized geometrically as the horocycle flow on the modular surface because this uh, quotient is the unit tangent bundle of the modular surface. Similarly, the geodesic flow moving along geodesics at speed one can be realized by the flow, by the action of diagonal matrices on the same space. Okay, so these are some of the historical reasons people got interested in actions such as these. Um, it turns out that these two actions are extremely different in their behavior. Okay, the geodesic flow, uh, so both of them exhibit uh, reasonable chaotic behavior. Both are ergodic, both are mixing with respect to the natural measure, but there the resemblance stops. The geodesic flow, when it acts on this uh, space uh, can give rise to extremely irregular behavior. <coughs> By this I mean, pardon me, that if you were to ask me, can you uh, say something about the invariant measures or the orbit closures of points when you move them around with the geodesic flow, I would be extremely hard pressed to do so. On the other hand, it was realized by uh, several people in the 70s, Fustenberg, Veach, and uh, Dani, that that is not true of the horocycle flow here. The horocycle flow admits extremely regular behavior. So it's possible to make a prediction about orbit closures for every point on this space. This is an absolutely mind-blowing thing if you work in chaotic dynamical systems, to tell somebody that you can predict the point, the orbit of every point, or at least list a finite uh, set of options amongst which it, you can find it, this is absolutely uh, unbelievable, but it's true. And not only is it true, it's true uh, generalized massively. So you could take a group which is a much bigger unipotent flow, you could leave that aside and say, I'm going to take a group which is generated by unipotent. For example, SL2R. The action of SL2R also will admit a regularity uh, like this. So this is what we're going to explore. Um, so as I said, these form a various class of dynamical systems. And uh, a frequent uh, theme in Dani's papers has been that he has been able to uh, spot very good connections with uh, number theory. So this thing I'll try to emphasize as much as I can. So uh, let's uh, uh, define our, uh, uh, what we are doing. So this unipotent uh, flow is just a matrix yeah. like this with eigenvalues one. Okay, it comes in two, in SL2R there are only two, basically the upper one and the lower one. And um, we are going to study what happens when we move around a point on a space such as this using the unipotent flow. So the first uh, basic result that I would like to mention in this regard is a result of Fustenberg from 73. And it says, uh, let's look at the situation where uh, the lattice I have is not SL2Z, 
By the way, so this space SL to R factor SL to Z is not a compact space. Okay, the best uh, or the fastest way to see this is to identify, as we did, the space with the moduli space of unimodular lattices. And to realize that uh, a lattice can have uh, very, very long uh, vectors, provided it comes with a corresponding very short vector. Okay, so this is some, uh, it's possible, it's easy to construct a sequence of lattices going off to infinity. So it's a finite volume, non compact space. That's not the space Fustenberg was considering. He was considering a finite value, volume, compact quotient. Such quotients exist. They are just orders, for example, orders in division algebra. And for these, he proved that, in fact, this horocycle flow is uniquely ergodic. There's only one ergodic measure on G1 gamma under this uh, horocycle flow. So this is a uh, very nice result. And then, uh, of course, the question is, what happens if you take a non-compact quotient such as SL to R factor SL to Z? Now, of course, uh, it would be a little bit uh, surprising if uh, the same result were true, right? I mean, a compact and non-compact quotient bears no resemblance, and also there is a problem of periodic trajectories. So here uh, we have a very nice result of uh, Dani's. Uh, so uh, Dani said that, so this is an ergodic flow. This was known to be an ergodic flow. So almost every orbit of uh, the unipotent flow is dense. And Dani proved that, in fact, these dense orbits equidistribute on the space. Okay, so what does it mean, equidistribute? It means if I take a suitable test function, say, continuous and compactly supported, and I average this function along an orbit, and let the length of the orbit go to infinity, then I'll get the integral of the function on the whole space. Okay, so not only is it uh, dense, but it visits each part of the space according to the area of this part. All right, it's equidistributed. Um, before that, Dani had a very nice paper where, uh, so this is an example of what is called a horospherical subgroup, but there are more general examples, for example, for instance, in SL3R. And uh, so uh, Dani was able to classify all ergodic invariant probability measures for actions of maximal horospherical flows on quotients G mod gamma when G is uh, a Lie group such that all non compact simple factors have real rank 1. Real rank 1 means uh, rank of maximum R split torus is 1. For instance, SL to R is a good example of real rank. Okay, so uh, this was the classification, and this uh, is a beautiful uh, theorem and very indicative of uh, the future. So this is the kind of thing that uh, made Raghunathan conjecture that, in fact, all unipotent flows should behave very regularly. Um, so what uh, are the ergodic invariant probability measures? Uh, every such measure is the Lebesgue measure on a finite volume homogeneous space. What does this mean? It means uh, you're starting with the horospherical flow on G mod gamma, and you pick a point. Uh, attached to this point is a closed subgroup of G. This contains the horospherical subgroup. It might be equal to it, but it definitely contains it. And the ergodic invariant measure is the Lebesgue measure on an orbit of this larger group. Okay, so this is a striking thing. It's a very rigid phenomenon. There are very few possibilities for this because there are very few close subgroups between the horospherical and G. Sometimes there are none. All right, so it's a striking feature because it's very rigid. It's completely in contrast to the geodesic flow. Okay, in the geodesic flow, there are uh, very, very many different options. So basically, we could have a game where you throw a number at me, say between two and three, and in theory, I should be able to construct uh, an orbit of the geodesic flow whose house of dimension is the number that you picked. Okay, it's a completely different situation. 
However, I would like to make this point now and return to it in the future. Conjecturally, the situation is uh, different for uh, higher rank cases. So if I were to look at an action of uh, Z2 on SL3R factor SL3Z, then according to conjectures of uh, Margulis and Katak, uh, this uh, flow should behave like a unipotent flow. This is still open, and we'll come back to this question briefly later. Some part of the 2010 Fields Medal of Elon Linden Strauss was uh, to show a very powerful theorem here, which says that under an entropy con consideration, this is a work of uh, Linden Strauss, Einsiedler, and Katak. So under an entropy assumption, there still exists such a classification like the motorcycle stuff. But the entropy assumption uh, is uh, not supposed to be required, so it's still an open problem. Oh, very good. We'll come back to this later. Uh, so every measure is the natural Lebesgue measure on a finite volume homogeneous space. And then Dani made his famous uh, measure conjecture, and which says, I'm not stating it uh, technically, it says that, uh, in fact, this kind of thing is supposed to hold in much greater generality. Okay, you could take a group like SL2R, which is not a unipotent one-parameter group, but which is generated by unipotent elements, and look at an action of SL2R on, say, uh, SL5R factor SL5Z, and the same kind of uh, classification uh, should be expected. So what... Uh, um, okay, before I say that, I should state uh, Raghunathan's topological conjecture. Uh, so the topological conjecture gives a description of the closures of the orbits, just as the measure conjecture gives a description of the ergodic invariant measures. Um, it says that the closure of every unipotent orbit on G mod gamma is again a finite volume homogeneous space. Now I remind you about the, the result of Dani on the previous page, which says that the dense orbits equidistribute, so there's also an equidistribution statement component in Ratner's theorems, which says that uh, the closure of every orbit is a finite volume homogeneous space, and uh, in fact, inside this orbit, the, inside the space, the orbit equidistributes. Okay? So this was um, the situation in the early 80s. Uh, there are several nice uh, results. So I should mention, um, as I've said, there are many significant advances by Dani. We've seen the horospherical one and the equidistribution one. There's more work on horospherical groups. There's a lovely paper of Dani and Smiley, which was inspired by Dani's work on uh, SL to R factor SL to Z. Um, there's a very nice paper of Dani and Margulis uh, about uh, somehow generic... Uh, uh, flows on SL3R. Um, I should say that uh, uh, these things, uh, for example, the horospherical and the horospherical are already quite complicated, but moving beyond horospherical is a new level of complication. So looking at something not horospherical in SL3R is a very, very impressive achievement. There, uh, I've also mentioned the paper of Dani and Raghavan, which is a, a really nice paper. So this uh, a paper, as far as I know, uh, is one of this, uh, the first papers which uh, started the study of uh, lattice orbits on homogeneous spaces. And uh, in fact, they gave a nice application to uh, uh, number theory to the study of frames. But uh, uh, so th in this uh, kind of paper, the question is a slightly reverse question. So you don't look at uh, uh, unipotent flow acting on SL2R factor SL2Z, but you ask a natural question, uh, what happens if uh, uh, SL2Z uh, acts on the plane, for example? So the plane is an example of uh, the punctured plane, to be more precise, of a homogeneous space. And uh, can you say something about the distribution of orbits? And this is uh, clearly a related question. It somehow seems to be a dual picture. But uh, 
the answers, while related, are not the same, and uh, Dani and Raghavan made a very uh, nice contribution there. So as was mentioned by Aravinda, the conjectures uh, of Dani and Raghunathan and the equidistribution statement were resolved in full generality by Marina Ratner in 1991. Um, Marina Ratner's proof uh, was different from the approach which Dani and Dani Margulis were pursuing at the time. Um, subsequent to Ratner's uh, publishing of all her proofs, uh, uh, a different, slightly different approach was um, uh, uh, explored in a paper of Margolis and Tomanov. And in this paper, um, somehow the role of entropy was brought into sharper focus. So it's... Uh, the papers of Ratner are uh, really very difficult to read and extremely... Um, uh, beautiful work, and somehow everything is done from uh, first principles. And so it, uh, it's really difficult to um, spot the strategy, but those who have spotted it have benefited greatly from, from her work. Okay, so uh, I just want to point out a few things. Uh, as I said already, the this uh, whole body of works making progress towards the Dani and Raghunathan conjectures are very influential. And along the way, while working on these things, Dani has introduced, and Dani and Margulis have introduced several tools which are now uh, part of uh, the toolbox that people like me use. So they're very uh, ubiquitous, very powerful tools. One of them is uh, this technique called linearization which is a beautiful uh, piece of work. It was in a paper of Dani and introduced in a paper of Dani and Margulis. And essentially it uh, tells us that, so one of the reasons unipotent flows are more well behaved is uh, that they're somehow polynomial in nature. Okay. Uh, Dave Vitti Morris, who wrote this uh, survey of Dani's work on homogeneous dynamics has a book called Ratner's Theorems. And if you read this book, the first chapter of the book, he describes the difference between a unipotent flow and a geodesic flow in terms of uh, babies. So imagine you have a room and two babies and a babysitter who briefly leaves the room for two minutes. So the unipotent baby might have moved a little, but uh, the movement is reasonably predictable and not very erratic. The geodesic baby has thrown up around all the walls and made a mess of the whole room. Nevertheless, even though unipotent flows are polynomial, they're still very complicated when uh, you apply them to homogeneous spaces. The linearization technique uh, replaces this uh, translation action by a linear action in some appropriate space. And of course, as you would imagine, this is a very powerful tool to possess. Okay, uh, let me now come to Dani's work on number theory. So I put up uh, screenshots of two papers of Dani's, which are my personal favorites. Uh, this paper of Dani is, is Dani's highest, most cited paper. Um, and uh, it uh, has a very powerful idea, which I want to explore now, uh, relating the trajectories of orbits to Diophantine properties of numbers. Okay. The second paper has a somehow um, is a quantitative form of a theorem of Margulis about non-divergence of unipotent flows. And rather uh, slightly unexpectedly, this has had a massive uh, impact on number theory as well. So I'll try to explain both these things uh, now. So uh, let's begin with a um, little bit of basic Diophantine analysis. So uh, there's this pigeonhole principle of Dirichlet, which uh, guarantees us that all real numbers have a certain uh, degree of approximation. So every real number uh, has an approximation uh, of the quality 
x minus p over q uh, less than or equal to 1 over q squared. So this is an inequality which holds for every real number and for infinitely many p and q. Okay? There are some numbers uh, for which you can't do much better than this, and these are called badly approximable numbers. These are numbers which admit the reverse inequality for a smaller value than 1. So x minus p over q is at least this constant over q squared for all p over q. Okay? So what's an example of a badly approximable number? An example is the square root of 2. Generally, uh, the square root of 2 has the property that uh, the entries in its continued fraction are periodic. More generally, it's known that a number is badly approximable if and only if the entries in the continued fraction are uniformly bounded. Yeah, actually, I meant to uh, make it a vector because it's more interesting when uh, dimension is higher. So uh, this thing is uh, sadly just wrong. So let me uh, correct myself. Uh, x minus p over q, so x is badly approximable if x minus p over q is at least uh, c of x over q squared. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, really makes Dani's work influential is that if x is a real number, you have at your disposal the continued fraction of x and the related dynamical system and the Gauss measure is a very powerful tool to analyze the Diophantine properties of x. If you move to two dimensions or higher, you lose this tool. And Dani's contribution somehow is to replace this tool by something which has to do with flows on homogeneous spaces. So what I meant to say was in higher dimensions, we would say that uh, a number is badly approximable. So the version of Dirichlet's theorem would be, uh, for example, that uh, q1 x1 plus qn xn uh, minus p is uh, less than or equal to 1 over q to the n. And the number would be badly approximable if you could replace this uh, by a smaller constant. Okay? Okay? So, uh, somehow the kind of uh, thing that's going on here is uh, we want to be able to say uh, something interesting about uh, the Diophantine property of a point or more generally maybe you take an interesting variety like a quadratic surface and can you say something about typical arithmetic points on this quadratic surface. Okay, so uh, Dani introduced a, a, a dictionary which uh, Kleinbach and Margulis have called the Dani correspondence, which I'm now going to introduce. Before that, let me say that these numbers, uh, like the square root of 2, they're not many. They're zero Lebesgue measure. So if you close your eyes and pick a number, it's not going to be badly approximable. On the other hand, uh, in, an, in another measure of size, house of dimension, they're full. So the house of dimension one. So in that sense, there are plenty of them. So uh, Dani said, uh, okay, here's a nice way to reformulate the property of being badly approximable in terms of lattices in the space SL n plus 1 R over SL n plus 1 Z. So let me just explain this on the board. So uh, here's the vector x1 to xn, and suppose I want to study this uh, kind of inequality. So what I should do is uh, associate to x a lattice, and I do it in the following fashion. Uh, I uh, have a matrix with ones on the diagonal, uh, x1 through xn, so it's an n plus 1 cross n plus 1 matrix, and uh, I take this matrix and turn it into a lattice. That's easy to do. Okay, so now uh, if you look at this lattice uh, and you write a typical vector in this uh, in Zn plus 1 as uh, p q1 up to qn, uh, then you'll see that the first coordinate of the lattice looks exactly like this. This gives you some uh, inkling of why these two things should be connected. And so what Dani said is the following. So consider the finite volume non-compact homogeneous space 
of lattices, unimodular lattices in Rn plus 1, Uh, start with the vector x, which is x1 to xn, and attach to this vector a point in the space of lattices in that manner, and then move this point along around using uh, this diagonal matrix flow. So the diagonal flow, which is uh, e to the n times t, e to the minus t, and so on up to e to the minus t. So let me call this uh, matrix G sub T. And uh, Dani proved that uh, X is badly approximable if and only if uh, the GT orbit of UX uh, must is uh, confined to a compact set. Okay? In the same paper, he proved another result which says there are certain vectors called singular vectors for which in some sense Dirichlet's theorem can be infinitely improved. So in the case of one dimension, these numbers are not interesting because they're rational numbers. But Kinchin proved in dimensions two and more that there are interesting examples of singular vectors, non-rational examples. Dani proved that you can infinitely improve Dirichlet's theorem if and only if the corresponding lattice has a divergent orbit, so it leaves every compact set. Okay, so in our minds, we attach the notion that having good approximations to vectors involves lattices going to infinity, and having bad approximations involves trapping lattices orbits in compact sets. And this uh, kind of dictionary has been refined significantly over the years by many, many people, and now you can very carefully fine-tune it to say that the speed at which you go to infinity reflects the extent of the good approximation that you have. Okay? It all started in that paper of uh, Dani's. Um, for the case of the of, of uh, real numbers and uh, uh, continued fraction expansion, it's probably worth mentioning that this idea of attaching, uh, looking at the upper half plane picture, uh, because the real line is the boundary, and trying to read off uh, uh, the continued fraction expansion using uh, geodesics is an idea which goes back to Emil Artin. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, he proved that uh, X is badly approximable if and only if this is bounded. And uh, this uh, term, which is called the Dani correspondence, has been used in many, many, many cases. So frequently what happens is that uh, we look, uh, you know, there's some long-standing problem in the number theory literature which is not getting solved. And uh, what you do is you try to see what happens, you plug in this Dani correspondence. And you get a statement on the other side. And sometimes you're able to prove it using the tools of ergodic theory. So it's a very powerful uh, uh, conduit to translate uh, arithmetic information into uh, dynamical information. Okay, so now uh, I mentioned that um, these house of these uh, badly approximable uh, vectors have zero Lebesgue measure and full house of dimension. Uh, Dani used this uh, information in a pretty spectacular way, and the point was that at the time uh, we knew that these flows are ergodic, so almost every orbit is going to be dense. So then you can ask, okay, so what about the non-dense orbits? Are there any non-dense orbits? Uh, you know, are there lots of them? What's going to happen to them? So what Dani did was he used this correspondence between badly approximable and bounded to conclude that there are lots of non-dense orbits. And in doing so, he introduced a game. This game was first introduced by Wolfgang Schmidt. And it's a beautiful thing, which can be explained to anybody. It consists of the following data. It consists of a complete metric space, a set which is fixed, two players, Alice and Bob, and two parameters, alpha and beta, both smaller than one. And the game is the following. Alice picks a ball, and then Bob picks a ball inside Alice's ball of size alpha times Alice's ball. <clears throat> 
and then Alice picks a ball inside Bob's ball of size alpha beta times Bob's and so on and so forth. You keep doing this, it's a complete metric space, so you're going to get a point inside eventually in the intersection of the balls. So the player who goes second, in this case it was Bob, wins the game if he can arrange that this point belongs to the set that we fixed in the beginning. Okay? And uh, Wolfgang Schmidt introduced this game to study badly approximable vectors. These game, the sets for which they're winning strategies enjoy many remarkable properties. For instance, they are full house of dimension. But there are many other features of these games. So Dani uh, proved that the set of bounded trajectories on G mod gamma is a winning set using this correspondence. And this was a very influential event because it introduced the Schmidt game into homogeneous dynamics. And this was really taken uh, forward by many people. Um, Margulis in his ICM address in Kyoto had a conjecture which tried to generalize what Dani had done to uh, more general simple groups and uh, somehow uh, so-called uh, non-quasi-unipotent flows on these groups. And this uh, conjecture was settled by Kleinbach and Weiss. And then there were lots of works. Uh, recently, there was an influential paper of Kurt McMullen, which introduced two new versions of Schmidt's game into dynamics. And uh, this really has become, uh, uh, you know, there, there are people who work only on Schmidt's game now, on dynamics. And the reason they do it is because of Dani's uh, paper on divergent and bounded trajectories. Okay. Um, Dani also had a nice paper where he studied endomorphisms of uh, tori and proved that a certain set uh, of um, non-dense orbit here is also winning for Schmidt's game. Okay, so now I'm going to come to the second paper, the paper on the right-hand side in the picture, which has to do with the divergence or non-divergence of unipot flows. And here's a nice theorem of Dani. It says, uh, you take a number C, a lattice, then there exists an epsilon such so that for any unipotent group, you have the following uh, estimate. The set of points in uh, 0 to t for which the length of the shortest vector of the orbit is smaller than epsilon is not very large. Okay? So I remind you of a, uh, a basic result involving the geometry of spaces like SL to R factor, SL to Z, it's Muller's compactness criteria. It says that in order for a sequence of lattices to go to infinity, the, they should, the lengths of their shortest vectors must go to zero. Okay, and you can see this uh, geometrically. And so what Dani uh, proved here was that uh, the set of points in a long orbit which are vanishing to infinity is not a very big uh, proportion of the orbit. In uh, qualitative form, the fact that uh, these unipotent flows have infinitely many visits to compact sets, this was a result of Margulis. This uh, qualitative form was conjectured by Piatesky Shapiro, and Margulis's, Margulis used his proof of the qualitative form in his proof of the arithmeticity theorem for lattices in semi-simple groups. Dani's uh, quantitative improvement of this has been extremely influential. Uh, first of all, Dani used it to prove that locally finite ergodic measures, invariant measures on G mod gamma are actually finite. This is a very useful result. Uh, this result uh, has been recast in uh, Teichmuller space by Minsky and Weiss, and more recently by Lindenstrauss and Mirza Khani. Um, another uh, in interesting uh, and nice application of Dani's uh, work here is by Margulis, who gave a new proof of uh, the boyle harishchandra theorem on uh, finiteness of, on uh, lattices. So I mentioned this in the beginning, that if you take a semi-simple D group without non-trivial Q characters, then the integer points form a lattice, 
Margulis gave a new proof of this uh, using this non-divergence of uh, unipotent flow. Uh, somehow the idea is uh, very ingenious, um, but maybe it's for another time. So I, I won't uh, mention it. Estimates such as these were used uh, cast for more general polynomial maps by Shah, Eskin, Moses Shah, and others. And they form a very basic uh, part of uh, the literature in homogeneous dynamics. It's a very standard uh, tool. Let me come lastly to this uh, kleinbach margulis thing. This really uh, set off a, another industry. So there was this uh, uh, long open conjecture in diophantine analysis called Springjux conjecture, which had to do with whether a typical point on a surface is well approximable by rationals or not. Conjecturally, it's not. What Kleinbach and Margulis did is that they used the refinement of Dani's uh, non-divergence estimate and another refinement of Dani's correspondence, two refinements of two different results, and settled the conjecture. Uh, and this uh, paved the way for uh, many, many interesting results in the subject. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to discuss uh, another of Dani's favorite topics, uh, which is quadratic forms. So uh, this is also a favorite topic of Margulis, and Dani and Margulis have written uh, several of the most influential papers in the subject. So to understand what any of this has to do with quadratic forms, let me take you back to uh, the time when we were all students and we were studying Serre's course in arithmetic. So if you look at the first chapter of Serre's course in arithmetic, you will find a theorem called Meyer's theorem. And it says that if you take a rational indefinite quadratic form in five or more variables, then this form has a rational zero. And the way you do it is, it's an indefinite form, so it has a real zero. And then you use a, a, what is, is possible to classify the p-adic invariance of the form, and then use the so-called hasse minkowski local global principle to produce a rational zero. This uh, result uh, was um, read by Oppenheim, who was a British mathematician and the vice chancellor of the National University of Singapore. He conjectured in the 1930s that if I start with an indefinite irrational form, so not a rational form, then I should almost have a integer zero, okay? So what he conjectured was that if I take an indefinite rational quadratic form in at least three variables, historically he said five and it was brought down to three, then uh, the set of integer values taken by the quadratic form is dense in the real line. I'm uh, uh, taking a little historical liberty here. There's some, Davenport is also involved here, so I'm, suppressing that in the interest of time. But um, this is the conjecture. This was open for a very long time. Uh, it was open for a very long time, uh, despite attempts by most of the famous analytic number theorists of the time, uh, Davenport, Heil Brown, uh, Swinerton Dyer, and so on and so forth, who employed the Hardy uh, Ramanujan circle method to attack this line of problems and succeeded in proving the result for forms in diagonal form in 21 or more variables. This was the state of affairs in the late 70s, early 80s. Then uh, what happened was that uh, Raghunathan noticed that uh, the conjecture would follow if you said something about the action of the stabilizer of these quadratic forms on the space SL and R factor SL and Z. Once he made this observation, uh, Margulis proved the conjecture by proving the dynamical statement. Okay? Uh, and uh, then uh, Dani entered, uh, uh, I mean, it could be argued that he was already in this subject, but he entered this quadratic form business and made many uh, very significant contributions. So they wrote a paper, Dani and Margulis, in which they proved a uh, a better version of the density, so you could replace, uh, you can upgrade integer vectors by integer vectors with GCD1. Uh, 
And uh, you can also look at uh, pairs of quadratic forms and the simultaneous density in R2. And Dani later uh, considered uh, also a very nice paper, density for a pair consisting of a quadratic form and a linear form. Uh, of course, I mean, in a situation like this, the analysis is much more involved because uh, you have to look at the joint stabilizer and uh, consider its dynamics. Um, then Dani and Margulis proved, uh, wrote a, a landmark paper. Uh, this paper was the paper that introduced this linearization, which I spoke about earlier. And in the context of quadratic forms in this paper, they proved the following uh, result. You can ask for something better than just density. Namely, you can ask how many vectors you can find in a ball of radius t uh, such that uh, uh, Q takes the value, uh, a value between the real numbers A and B. So you would ask for some sort of asymptotic as t goes to infinity of this uh, quantity. And uh, Dani and Margulis uh, proved uh, basically uh, that... Um, so they gave uh, a lower bound, they gave the right lower bound for this asymptotic, uh, which is, so it turns out that in almost all cases, this orbit equidistributes. And so this, uh, the right answer should be the volume of this region, which can be computed and is of the form uh, 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 t to the a log t to the b. But in this uh, influential paper, uh, Dani and Margulis proved uh, uh, lower bound, uh, and then subsequently an upper bound was proven by uh, Eskin Margulis Moses in uh, a series of two papers. So this is, uh, I, I, I think, one of uh, the most influential papers in this subject. It, it has a lot of uh, extremely beautiful ideas. Uh, Margulis's proof of uh, uh, this Oppenheim conjecture uh, depended on the construction or the existence of a certain kind of object called the minimal set. And uh, in the original formulation of the proof, uh, uh, he used the axiom of choice. And then Mar Dani published uh, uh, an elementary proof of this. And it, this did not depend on the axiom of choice. I was speaking to uh, Dani two days back and he informed me that uh, I was actually not uh, accurate exactly about this. So it turns out that you don't need the uh, axiom of choice at all for this set. But nevertheless, this elementary proof is a very beautiful article to read. And uh, after Dani uh, wrote this, there was another elementary proof by Dani and Margulis as well. Yes. Uh Talk about some, what are the open problems in the area, I think. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, okay, so this uh, area is uh, quite uh, blessed because there are lots of good open problems. The significant, most significant open problem is the one that I mentioned about this high rank action. This seems to be uh, very difficult. The problem is to prove a statement like uh, Dani Raghunathan conjectures for this. So describe every orbit closure and every ergodic invariant measure for this. Uh, this seems to be very uh, problematic so far in the sense that um, this idea of uh, Einsiedler, Linus, Strauss, and Katok seems, which was, it was pushed subsequently by Einsiedler, Linus, Strauss in a series of papers. And from talking to them, what I seem to, the, the consensus seems to be that the logical limit of their approach has been reached and now a new idea is needed to settle this kind of thing. That's one open problem. But uh, otherwise, you know, the connections to number theory provide a wealth of problems. For example, we know a lot about quadratic forms, but in some sense, we know almost nothing. So, you know, larger systems of quadratic forms. Um, there have been some work by other people on uh, diophantine properties of uh, surfaces there have been, there's been an uh, interesting application of this circle of ideas to um, various things like uh, Hecke orbits and so on and so forth. Higner points by Watson. There's a wealth of uh, different applications and each of them has plenty of open problems. In 2007, there was a, 
a focused workshop at the American Institute of Mathematics, uh, where Alex Gorodnik wrote up an article called Open Problems in Dynamics. Subsequently, in the last 10 years, several of them have been solved. So two years ago, a year and a half ago, we had another of these sessions in Goa. And uh, someone is writing up another updated list of open problems. So once it's available, maybe I'll uh, give it to Aravinda and he can share it with you. But the message uh, I'm trying to project is that, uh, you know, this is one of these uh, parts of mathematics which is very much open for business. We have our share of intractable problems, but we also have a lot of exciting opportunities and directions where um, it's possible to make progress. Uh, so I have one question. So this was dynamics, okay. So now how much it is connected to geometry? I mean, especially how much it is connected to the work by Eskin and Mirzakhani? Okay, so the question is, uh, what is the connection of the circle of ideas to the work of Eskin Mirzakhani and Eskin Mirzakhani and Mohammadi? Uh, I am not going to describe what that work is, except to say that uh, there's a, um, another moduli space of geometric objects, and there's another slightly more complicated group action on this moduli space. And the hope was that uh, this group action on this other moduli space has a lot of the regularity features that unipotent flows on homogeneous spaces have. That's the broad hope. Um, so this hope has been uh, in the geometry and dynamical community for about uh, 17, 18 years now. And there's been uh, periodic progress by several people. Uh, most spectacular recent progress was uh, this uh, Eskin Mezakhani work where they um, managed to uh, give a classification uh, of a certain class of group actions. So um, my understanding of this is a little bit limited, so I'll uh, restrict myself to saying only things I'm reasonably confident about. So uh, what is true is that uh, the first attempt at trying to prove Eskin Mirzakhani was to try to uh, see how far the main ideas of these polynomial divergence and all in Ratner's theorem go through. And then my understanding is that this uh, was deemed to be insufficient. And uh, I didn't mention uh, a very important recent work by the French mathematicians Benoit et Caen. This has to do with classification of stationary measures on homogeneous spaces. So the work of Eskid Mirzakhani borrows heavily also from Benoit and Caen. So I think it's fair to say on a... Um, philosophical level that uh, you know the ideas uh, to some extent come from homogeneous dynamics but of course uh, it's a monumental work which needed a lot of new ideas any any further questions if if i remember right this this was of eskin mirzakhani the theorem sort of uh, i mean and the ratner's work uh, classification of the orbit I think it's called sort of a magic wand theorem, I think, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's sort of, I think, I don't know who called it magic wand theorem, but I mean, I just... Maybe McMullen said something like that. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic theorem. You know? yeah. it's, a, it's, it's like uh, one of these uh, Dani, Dani Margulis, Ratner kind of things. You don't expect something uh, that good to happen to you. <laughs> if, you're, if you're an end user and you want to use something like this, it's great. So in that sense, it's a magic one. Okay, so we'll thank Anish once again and uh, yeah.